everybody. Uh, so what we're doing today is uh, we are going to be voting online. So if you don't know, in Washington State, um, uh, you can vote online if you're an absentee voter. So I got this email, eh, vote.wa. Um, as a uniformed or overseas citizen, I would be the overseas citizen voter, you have requested to receive your ballot electronically. This email is to notify you that your ballot is available and ready for you to access, which means I can go ahead and vote in the general election today. And that's what we're intending to do if everything goes well. And uh, you can also do it by mail if you want to. So uh, you can get your ballot sent to you and then you can turn it into the mail. But it's a lot more convenient for me to use the online system in order to vote online. So we've got a VPN running, so we've got a nice secure connection and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we're going to close this email here. And so if you click through on the link, this is what you're going to see. Uh, Pierce County uh, votes. So I'm in Pierce County in Washington, so that's kind of the area in which I'm going to be voting. And we've got a link to a voter's guide here, which uh, I've opened up on the screen. So, and the way I generally vote, uh, I do a little research ahead of time, but I also, I keep the voter's guide up here. So I can go and kind of research things, look at the candidates, see what they have to say, read about ballot measures and all that kind of thing as I'm going through. Um, so some things I'm going to know ahead of time when I get in there and some things I won't know until I get in. Now I'm trying to get it to where I can see the comments on Facebook here, but it's not working terribly well, I'm afraid. Uh, so we're going to reboot this Creator Studio program real quick and see if that improves things. Because I'd like to be able to see people chatting and stuff while we're going here. Uh, and comments? No. It's not coming up for some reason for me. So, oh well, so be it. Um, but if we see them in there, we'll do our best. Okay, at any rate. So we may not be very good at uh, giving feedback here while we go, but uh, we'll give it our best shot. Uh, I can try, actually, I'm just going to take up the Facebook app and we'll try that instead. Ah, uh, I see, I see. That makes sense. So we'll just get this open here and then I'll get the uh, comments. Not sure how I switched to the comment mode. Following comments. There we go, because we've got a comment. Except it's not working so well. I'll let you fiddle with that. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we got our voter's guide over here, and then we're going to continue to mark the ballot. Now, if I get to where there's some kind of sensitive information, uh, we'll probably stop sharing. So I've got to fill out my first name, last name, and date of birth. So let's start with that. Oh, look, we've got autofill. Uh, Trent. And um, I am going to temporarily hide this while I put in my date of birth, but you'll get to still see me. Um, just because that's vaguely sensitive information here. So just a temporary hide. So I'm going to put in my date of birth. Um, mm -hmm, doo -doo 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 -doo, which I will say is in July. Uh, but since this will be shared fairly publicly, we don't want to give people that information directly since it is a security option. Okay. All right. Let's go back here and get that on screen. Oh, and I can see comments now? Maybe. Okay, so they should scroll up and we'll see them. All right, sounds good. Uh, okay, so we're back over here. Switch screens. So Anne in the back end there, my technical producer helping me out with stuff like this. Although this isn't like one of my official broadcasts, it's just something I'm doing for fun because I think it's interesting. Um, so now let's talk a little bit here as I sit on the screen and confirm your eligibility to the system. Military overseas voters, check, check. Eligible to use the system. I am in Sapporo, Japan right now. Uh, so I'm certainly eligible for the system. And I understand my selections marked the system be printed, must be printed by me and mailed by local election officials, electronically submitted through the system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all that is absolutely true. We'll continue. Now, before I went and did this uh, broadcast, I did some research on the legality of doing this because I think it's pretty important to be legal when it comes to voting. And so in Washington state, it is legal to share your ballot, uh, what you've printed on it and to show pictures of it and that kind of thing. So there are some states where it's not. If you're in Illinois, be careful because it is like a felony. You can have up to three years jail time by showing your printed ballot. They used to have a lot of problems with uh, corruption there in Chicago and Illinois. So they have some pretty strict rules about these kinds of things. I mean, that was really more people like, you know, getting paid to vote for a certain way. So you show them proof of your ballot and that sort of thing. So they made these laws to protect that. So a lot of the laws that prevent you from taking, say, like a selfie or something with your ballot, 
these are pretty old. Um, basically, they, they try to prevent bribe schemes and things like that. So people can prove that they voted a certain way and get paid for it. Um, we're not doing any of that. I'm just voting of my own free will uh, without influence of anybody else. Uh, and uh, that's that. All right, searching for my ballot. Let's see what happens. Now, of course, I, I didn't preview all this. So if something goes a little weird, so print in return, electronic return, we want to do electronic return. And uh, ballot marking, and we're in. So this is what my ballot looks like. Uh, pretty nicely formatted for the screen. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff to vote on here today, and uh, we'll go through it one at a time. It'll be a little bit slow, and we'll start at the beginning. Uh, a lot of people are waiting for that presidential vote. That'll come a little bit later, because uh, I'll go in order here from 1 to 30. I got 30 things to fill out. So first up, referendum measure number 90. The legislature passed engrossing substitute bill three, uh, 5395 concerning comprehensive sexual education and uh, uh, health education. The bill would require school districts to adopt or develop consistent with state standards, comprehensive age appropriate sexual health education as defined for all students uh, and excuse students if their parents request. Okay, so um, now I have researched these a little bit ahead of time before we came on, but I still, I wanna show you the process and kind of how I do some of that. So we can open up the voter's guide for measures and this is referendum measure number 90. So you'd click on this in the voter's guide. Uh, you can see the measured text here, which is the same that we just read, but you can see quite a lot of other things. So you can get an explanatory statement. Um, this was a ballot measure by the people. So it was a, you know, a referendum that was put together and then put on the ballot to vote. Um, and so we've got this information here about what it is. Basically, this is sort of mandating that uh, schools inside Washington state teach sex education. Um, it doesn't say exactly how that they should teach it, but a board will be put together to create a set of standards. And then it's up to each of the school districts to implement those standards as best they can, according to the guidelines. Uh, it's supposed to be age appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, I think uh, each district is able to decide for themselves whether they have that or not. Um, and over here, we've got a fiscal impact statement. There's basically no fiscal impact for the state because it's just sort of a mandate. I suppose there's a board, but that's made by people who are already getting paid by the government anyway to put this information together. Uh, and then the cost really falls upon the local schools in order to implement. Um, and I do have a little bit of a problem putting costs on local schools that you're not actively paying for. But uh, here in the arguments for and against, and you can read through these, um, basically people who are supporting the measure get to make arguments for, people who are against the measure get to make arguments against, uh, and then they have some rebuttals and they go back and forth and this sort of thing. Uh, there is funding available for schools from the federal level in order to implement these kinds of programs. So uh, for a large part, uh, this would be paid for by those existing programs uh, and the schools wouldn't have a special burden on them. I generally think it's good to provide uh, sex education in the schools uh, at, you know, in an appropriate level. Now, you know, I have opinions about what kind of sex education is appropriate for what ages, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so generally I do approve of this kind of measure. I think it uh, creates a lot better public health. I think it's better for the safety of the students because they get awareness of uh, sexual harassment issues, things to look out for so that they don't become victims. I think that sort of thing is very important. Um, and uh, generally I am for destigmatizing sex education for children, I think. Um, you know, it's something you need to learn. It, it's something that you should learn in an appropriate kind of way. And I do, in this case, have trust that the people who will be putting together these standards will be diligent. And because parents can opt out of this education for their students, I think that's an important caveat. I, I think it's worthy, so I will approve this measure. Uh, so that's kind of how I go. And like I said, I would read these in more detail, but I, because I'm live streaming, I don't want to spend all day reading these things out loud. I read a lot of this stuff ahead of time. So uh, I definitely considered the arguments for and the arguments against. I found the arguments against to be pretty unconvincing. The arguments for kind of in the middle, not super slam dunk, but overall, uh, I think I'll go with this and support it. All right, next up is advisory vote number 32. Now these advisory votes really, really don't have all that much impact. They tend to be tax measures and fiscal measures. They are already passed into law and then the legislature is asking us to comment on them. I think that's kind of nonsense. Uh, I'm not sure why it is that we're to be commented. Are they going to roll them back if we don't like them? I don't think so. I don't think that generally happens. So it's a bit silly, but we're still gonna give them some consideration. And I read about these too. Now these ones um, in the voter's guide here, 
they don't so much have all the for and against information on these. So if you go look at these advisory boats, this is number 32, all you get is a cost projection. It's pretty funny, it says cost, but that's actually like cost to the public. So this is the revenue that's being generated. Um, and then it tells you who vote or how, what the final votes were. And that's about it. You don't get a arguments for and against this kind of thing because the legislator did it. And it's, there's no civil advocates for these positions. Um, so at any rate, uh, this one is a retail tax on retail establishments collected for carryout bags. Uh, and it'll raise about $32 million in the first 10 years uh, for government spending. And the spending, I think in this case, is appropriated specifically. You can read the actual uh, full text of the document here in the advisory, and I did look it over. Um, the money mostly goes for transportation spending to build roads uh, and for public transit. Uh, which I think is a bit strange for uh, you know, collecting charges on bags. I'll have to say my tax philosophy is that the government should have kind of mostly general taxes um, that is doesn't have a lot of loopholes and special interests. Like these people are taxed more, these people are taxed less. I like a progressive tax system so that people who don't have a lot of money aren't paying a lot of tax. People who have a lot of disposable income are paying a little bit higher percentage. I think that's reasonable. Um, I think income taxes, property taxes are all pretty reasonable methodologies. Uh, I like value added taxes over sales taxes if you're going to go on the retail side, uh, because I think it's more evenly distributed. And then I think government should decide where they're going to spend the money that they have available to them. I don't really kind of like the, uh, the tax a specific thing to get a specific amount of money to go somewhere, unless say it's something very specific to handle an externality. An externality is a, an uncaptured cost. So say, let's say the cigarette industry and smoking, um, that causes lung cancer. The government ends up paying for people's health insurance. So uh, it tends to be kind of a good thing in order to have a tax on cigarettes uh, in order to pay for those extra costs that occur. My economics background showing here, right? Um, at any rate, um, I am kind of, uh, I think, you know, discouraging disposable bags is kind of a nice thing. Um, uh, I guess I'll go on maintain on this one, but I don't feel really good about that, but so it goes. All right, this next one here, um, number 33, legislation imposed without a vote of the people, a tax on heavy equipment rentals to consumers by heavy equipment rental property dealers. And this will raise about $103 million in the first 10 years. <clears throat> and this one is pretty odd in that um, the actual text says that the heavy equipment rental is exempt from the normal taxes. And this is like a special tax that's kind of added on to them uh, and it specifically goes to a board, and this uh, board is uh, going to uh, distribute the money in some kind of unusual and interesting ways. <clears throat> it's very similar to this next one, too. I, it's just too specific, too weird. I would just like them to pay the normal sales tax that everybody else pays. That would be a lot better. And uh, so, yeah, I'm saying no on this. Don't really like the way it's set up. I, this doesn't matter because we'll just do it anyway, but... Uh, so it goes. I will I will share my voice such as I can. <clears throat> All right, number four, advisory vote number 34 in gross substitute Senate Bill 6492. All right, this one's really complicated. Legislature increase without a vote of the people, the business and occupation tax on certain businesses while reducing certain surcharges. Um, so this one like targets a bunch of specific types of businesses. It's $843 million. It's a big one. And it goes to this like job creation education board. And so this board decides where this money will be spent on different kinds of educational things. Generally, I like educational things. The complexity of this thing is really high and it only targets like certain kinds of businesses, aerospace business, and the, you know, this kind of business, that kind of business long list that they have to pay special B&O taxes. I have to say, I don't, I don't like this kind of proposal. This is not how I think government should raise money. I think the government does need to raise money. And I think you need to pay for the spending that you have and you need to decide what kind of spending is appropriate. I'm not like a big tax hawk exactly, but I don't like this kind of ad hoc cherry picking revenue raising. So um, yeah, I'll say no. Again, won't really matter, but I'll say no anyway. <clears throat> All right, advisory vote number 35. Legislation increased without a vote of the people, the business occupation tax on manufacturers of commercial airplanes, including components tooling. So basically this is a tax on Boeing uh, here, a specific one, and again, uh, I don't really support that kind of taxation. So yeah, no, no thanks. All right, next up, ooh, you can see the president coming up here. Exciting. Okay, uh, but before we get to that, we have a proposed constitutional amendment. And I don't remember seeing this. So 
I may have to read in some greater detail what we've got here. <clears throat> so this would be, I don't know, is it in the measures? And gross joint resolution? No, I don't think so. Hmm, interesting. I don't see it in my voter's guide. That's tricky. Uh, is it like hiding in a special place here? Statewide candidates? No, that would be statewide. I don't know. That's very interesting. Okay, well, we'll get back to that. Let's read it here. The engrossed Senate joint resolution number 12, uh, 8212. The legislation has proposed a constitutional amendment on investment. Oh, no, I did read about this. Public funds. This amendment would allow public money held for a fund for long-term care services and support to be invested by governments as authorized by state law, including investments in private stock. This sh um, Should this constitutional amendment be approved or rejected? <clears throat> All right. So this is, of course, the Washington State Constitution, for anyone who's paying attention. Um, it generally prohibits investing state funds in the stock market. They have to be invested in basically government bonds, um, which are super safe. Let's be honest. Um, the government of the United States is not going to go bankrupt anytime terribly soon, despite the fears that people may have. It has a huge industrial base uh, with to draw tax money on. So it's pretty safe investment, to be honest. Um, so yeah, and that's the way like social security works and some other government institutions. Now, this specific program is one in which, um, the, uh, it, it's kind of like a rainy day fund for an aging population that's really smart for the government to set this up, uh, to help pay for medical expenses, state sponsored medical expenses for the aging population. So it's saving up money now for a big problem that's coming down the line, which all of America and really honestly, all the world has to face where we're starting to have aging populations in most of the countries of the world especially the developed countries. <clears throat> that means higher percentage of dependent people and a lower percentage of production producing people. Hopefully automation and things will help take care of this problem. But at any rate, uh, very wise of them to set up this fund. Now, so the question is, do you invest it only in government bonds? Government bonds tend to pay a pretty low yield. Um, so private stocks can pay a high yield, but they're a lot more risky. So it's this risk versus reward attitude. Is this something that you want to be entirely 100% safe? but maybe not grow or a little more risky. Um, now, of course, you know, if you read the for and against, they're going to bring up these two points because that's the real decision that you have to make. And there's also some issues of government corruption because if you invest in the stock market, um, there could be an incentive for a company to kick a little bit of money to a politician in order to direct the investment off to a certain uh, company or something like that. Helps their stock price, makes them money, et cetera, et cetera. So there's potential for corruption. All that said, um, I think, you know, a balanced portfolio is generally best. Anyone who does an investment will tell you that uh, for long-term growth opportunities, you want a piece of the stock market. You also would like a piece of the rest of the economy and the government economy is very safe. So you want to balance these things out. Uh, generally, the stock market is a good investment. It does go down. Um, it is more volatile. So I think, you know, some portion should be invested, but right now the constitution prevents any portion from being invested. I think that's a little bit too absolute. So I am going to approve uh, this measure. Um, and a little bit by way of showing that um, I, you know, as we come in here to the presidential election, I'm not a hardcore liberal or a committed Democrat or anything like that. I'm an independent voter. I tend to have some sort of conservative views when it comes to fiscal policy. Um, that doesn't include not spending money on uh, social programs. I tend to be pretty progressive in that regard. Um, but when it comes to kind of balancing the budget and how we apply taxes, um, I tend to be a little bit more conservative, a little bit more like, look, we should have a fair, relatively simple system that people can understand and participate in. Um, so, and I do think there are things that are inappropriate for government to do. And I think there are things that are appropriate for government to do as far as spending goes. So I have my own opinion. Um, however, that said, as we move in towards the president of the United States, uh, let me tell you my voting strategy this year, and it will make this voting go a little bit fast. Uh, I really don't like President Trump. I think he's a, kind of a disgrace to the country, and I think that uh, he needs to be removed from office before he does any more damage. I am not a big fan of the person I will be voting for, which is Biden. Uh, I don't especially like Biden. I'm not a huge fan of Kamala Harris either. They're okay. Um, the sort of competent Democrats and boy, I will be very happy to have somebody competent in the office, uh, who doesn't embarrass me all the time. So I do feel pretty strongly about this, right? I don't do politics over my other channel for live streaming, but, um, but I do have very strong political views. And I think the Republican party in their national platform has basically said, whatever Trump says, that's what we're going to do. 
To me, that is a complete abrogation of any kind of political responsibility, any kind of ideals, any kind of moral backbone, any kind of principles. And I think the Republican Party at the moment has lost all their sense of principles and they're not governing. Now, I hold some conservative values. I'm a, I live my life in a pretty conservative kind of way, actually. Um, I'm a politically liberal minded. I like to try new ideas. I like to experiment. I think there's always a better way and we should be looking for better ways to do things, not just look to the past and the way we've done them traditionally. So in that sense, I'm pretty liberal minded. But, um, you know, I'm a pretty conservative guy. I don't do drugs. I don't really drink alcohol. Uh, I've got one wife and it will stay that way forever. Um, I believe in uh, taking care of children. I believe in community values, a lot of things like this that conservatives also hold true. I don't think Donald Trump represents any of that stuff. Um, he just represents greed and himself and a kind of meanness. And, uh, and I think he's completely incompetent in office. So I'm voting against him. And because the Republican Party has made their agenda, their official agenda, we do whatever Trump says, I am officially rejecting the Republican Party. I will not vote for any of their candidates. Wherever they appear against a Democrat on this ballot, I will vote for the Democratic Party. Um, that's not how I normally vote. I normally look at every candidate, Republican or uh, Democrat, and I often vote for independent candidates. Uh, this year I'm not. I'm maximizing the chances that Trump loses, so I'm voting for the Democrat. Uh, normally I might vote for Green Party or I might vote for the Libertarian Party. I, I think both of them have things on their platform that are very worthy. If you want to vote for them, that's great. If you want to vote for Trump, please don't. But if you do, it's your right. Uh, each individual American could vote for who they like, right? I mean, that's how this system works. I respect that part of democracy. So you vote for who you need to vote for. But I am going to vote for Joseph R. Biden and Kamala Harris on the Democratic ticket. And I'll be voting for every Democrat I see. Now, when there's two Democrats, which can happen in Washington state, I'll pick one of those. I'll go look at their profiles and choose between them. But if it's Republican Democrat, it's going to be Democrat. I'm not going to think twice about it. I don't really advocate that kind of position normally, but this is very special circumstances. I think the Republican Party has completely abrogated their responsibility uh, and gone with um, someone who has no political spine, no real moral values. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, we're going to move along. So I'm sorry, folks, if I got your blood boiling a little bit, but I do feel strongly about that. And voting this way is one of the reasons I was excited to be able to do my ballot so early. I uh, get this thing taken care of as soon as possible. All right, moving on. Uh, next partisan office here. This is the United States representative for sixth Congress. Uh, we've got two. I could write somebody in, but look, it's a Democrat. I'm voting for them. Uh, Republicans, stop just following Trump, please. Um, get yourself some real principles once again. That would be nice. All right, next up. Uh, state partisan office. We have the governor, uh, Jay Inslee, um, who I generally think is doing a reasonable job, if not wonderful. Um, uh, by the way, any political office, you can't be perfect. It's a very difficult thing. Uh, we've got a Republican. There's no chance that they're going to win anyway, but we're voting against them. I will say my vote here is probably not super impactful because uh, I'm voting in a very democratic district in a rather relatively democratic state. So what are you going to do? Um, all right, we've got two people who want to be lieutenant governor. So we're actually going to go look these guys up. Uh, lieutenant governor, we've got Denny Heck. And I generally will go by um, their statement here, but you can also look at some of their endorsements, kind of telling if sometimes people say things that aren't necessarily true. Well, the endorsements will help you sort that out. All right, so what's he got to say? Uh, so he's a U.S. member of the House, so he's got experience in this area. Um uh, Intrepid Learning Studios, so he's pretty involved in the world. He's been involved in CSAN, Chief of Staff for Governor Booth Gartner. So a lot of political experience, this guy. I believe he is the current um, Denny Heck. This Okay, yeah, up here, up at the top, Denny Heck. Uh, statement. As we navigate the unprecedented challenges that lie ahead, it's critical that we have state leaders with experience, competence, and civility to guide our government on the path of a more prosperous future for all. Uh, as a lifelong Washingtonian and Democrat, I've served every level of government and been committed to promoting values and fair and just economic system, strong public education, commitment to our environment, uh, so on and so forth. I continue to champion these causes while fulfilling other duties. Uh, constitutionally assigned as lieutenant governor, so he's the current sitting governor, uh, a lieutenant governor. With your continued trust on uh, this office, I will sure I won't roll back uh, the progress we have worked so hard in Washington State. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at the other feller or lady, as the case may be. 
Um, I also will tend to vote in uh, for minorities and women when I, if it's a close call, I will do that often because I like diverse views. All right, so this gentleman, um, majority floor leader. Okay, so he has Senate experience uh, and from Georgetown University. So he has a political education, board of directors, Institute for Public Policy. So this guy is certainly pretty qualified. The son of a carpenter, <laughs> the school lunch lady. Okay, humble roots. I learned the importance of hard work, education, opportunity for all. Guided my public service and advocacy, working for the people and vulnerable. I'll build my record of proven leadership, break barriers. Uh, Lieutenant Governor's most important job serving as a Senate president. Uh, as the only candidate who has served in the Senate, I'm uniquely positioned to get results. I've used my position as majority floor leader to establish the most generous paid family leave package in the country. Close big business tax lose holes. I like that. Expand voting rights, uh, protect reproductive health care, build light rail. So I like that this guy is mentioning some specific categories of policy initiatives. While Congress is mired in gridlock, special interest money here in Washington, we've taken bold action and with bipartisan support as lieutenant governor. So he's kind of pushing a little bit more liberal agenda than the other fellow. Endorsements, uh, Washington State Labor Council, conservation voters. I like that. Alliance for gun responsibility. Interesting. So this guy's a little more, um, a little more progressive, a little more liberal than the other feller. Um, you know what? Uh, Denny Heck is most likely going to win. Uh, I like this guy's uh, cut. Now he says like, I'm the only one with Senate experience, but uh, the sitting Lieutenant governor sits as president of the Senate. So that would mean Denny Heck actually does have Senate experience since he's sitting as president of the Senate. But at any rate, we'll give uh, Marco here a chance and we'll throw him a vote. Good for you, sir, uh, for being competent. All right. Don't think he will win. Uh, usually the incumbents are going to pick that up, especially in Democrat on Democrat. Looks like the more progressive choice. Not that I'm strongly progressive, but I love underdogs. So sometimes I use my vote to encourage people a little bit like that. Okay, next up, we've got uh, Secretary of State. Oh, look, Democrats and Republicans. All right, Gail... Tarleton, uh, congratulations to get my vote without any effort whatsoever. Next up, state treasurer. We've got a Republican and a Democrat. Now, I, you know, when it comes to guarding the hen house, um, I will often consider the Republican, but not this year. Sorry, guys, grow a spine. All right, next up, state auditor. <clears throat> um, we've got Patricia and Chris Labock. Uh, all right, Pat, and once again, you get my vote. Uh, Attorney General Bob Ferguson and Matt Larkin. Now, this is a little bit special here. Bob Ferguson was my representative when I lived in Stohomish uh, County. Or not, was it Stohomish County? Hmm, I'm not sure. Anyway, he was uh, my representative when I was up in Shoreline in Washington. No, that wouldn't be Stohomish County. It's still King County. Um, and he was an amazing guy. You know, he sent these nice emails and letters all the time talking about what he was working on, what he was doing. I really like this guy. He is a good guy. He really impressed me by connecting to the people. Now, um, some people don't like him so much as attorney general. He's a bit uh, activist attorney general, but you know what? He's often out there fighting against Donald Trump and I like that. So he definitely gets my vote, not just because he's a Democrat, because I like the cut of his jib. Bob Ferguson uh, kind of fights for the people. So I like him. All right. Commissioner of Public Lands. Here's another one where I might consider a Republican, but usually I don't because of environmental reasons. Uh, but this year, we're not even thinking about it. Hillary Franz gets my vote. All right, next up, uh, State Nonpartisan Office Superintendent of Public Instruction. Now, look at this. We don't have uh, Republicans and Democrats this time around, so we're going to go look at these guys. And I think this is still a state office. So Superintendent of Public Instruction, we've got Chris Raikdahl uh, and Maia Espinoza. Uh, so let's see what they have to say. So here's Chris. Uh, now, sometimes these guys will betray a strong, like, you know, party thing in their statement anyway, even though it's nonpartisan office. So he was superintendent of public instruction currently. So he holds this office already. Uh, law school board director, uh, classroom teacher. All right. So he's got good experience in this area. He went to uh, University of Wa State, um, Washington State University. All right. Is he a cougar? Oh, no. Yeah, no, I don't care about that. Um, volunteer in schools, use soccer coach, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, thank you, Washington voters. I'm grateful to serve as your superintendent of public education. We've achieved so much together, record graduation rates, more rigorous course tracking. I like how he's, he's uh, going over his laudables here. Dual language learning uh, is expanding. Yeah, I'm a little dubious about that. I, I think it's important to have dual language learning, but I also think it's important for students to definitely learn English. 
uh, and move into the, the main language here in the U.S. Uh, it's one of my conservative things showing. Uh, civics is a graduation requirement again. Okay, I think that's important. Career and technical education is graduating pathway options. School instru instruction, all-time high. Uh, you know, if you need it, that's great. Uh, creating thousands of jobs, that I don't care about in education. Uh, teachers are finally earning competitive market salaries. That's important. Healthcare has been expanded to thousands of additional school employees. That's really good. Major work ahead of us. Yeah, COVID-19. Good luck with that. Uh, improve kindergarten readiness. Okay. Build more career and technical education programs. I think that's a good move. Uh, we must ensure that rural communities have equitable access to education resources. I think that's important and very difficult to do because the tax levies for education tend to be local. So that's pretty tough. All right. So let's check out uh, Maria Espinoza and what she's got going on. And Chris is looking pretty good here. I like his agenda. All right, uh, young, uh, young lady here. I, I, like I said, I have a soft spot for new people in politics and the underdog, so we'll see. Not a politician bringing much needed new perspective to our school system. I don't know that that's necessarily good. You need to do the work of politics. It's good to have some experience. Uh, business owner, school teacher, uh, student data task force, opportunity gap oversight committee. So she definitely cares about education, so that's important. Um, uh, curriculum, so she's educated in the education area, Pacific Lutheran University, attended a dozen public schools nationwide. I, I'm not sure. That's that's pretty interesting to put on there. Center for Latino uh, Leadership Director, youth soccer coach. Okay, involved in her community. That's good. <clears throat> our schools are facing a defining moment. Teachers aren't happy. Families are stressed. Students are struggling. The opportunity gap is widening. The delivery of public education has changed dramatically, and we've been forced to adapt. Now, is our chance to regime uh, to reimagine, reimagine? I guess that's correct. A better education system because the status quo is no longer an option. I see. Why is that? Uh, to improve our school system, we need to use technology to innovate classrooms, unlock possibilities for more personalized learning, provide school schedules that fit the needs of working families and teachers. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, key life skills like managing finances, independent living. That's pretty important. Um, and resolving conflicts. Yeah, this is a good agenda. Uh, with kids in my own public schools, I support uh, parental choice and local control. Incumbent ignored parents and educators by championing a policy that teaches sexual positions to fourth graders. Uh, yeah, I kind of doubt that, to be honest. Uh, meanwhile, half of educators Washington are failing to meet standards and core subjects. Kind of losing me here in her focus. So, yep. Um, Chris Rydahl, you get the win here. I feel like this is a bit of a rabble rouser, not really talking about substantive issues that school boards actually have control over. So, all right, um, state partisan offices. Uh, all right, yep, let's see. Hey, look, it's a Democrat. We're voting for them. Congratulations. Uh, 27th legislative district. We've got a Democrat here, Janine Daraniel. Please go do a good job. Thank you. State representative position number one, Lauren Jenkins. Uh, oh, we have two Democrats here. Hold on, hold the phone. We've got to go look at them. So this is, is this still state? Or we are legislative candidates. So we've got to go down here. And uh, this is position number one, uh, state representative position number one. But that's not our district. We're in 27th district. So that's down here. All right, here's uh, Lorreen Jenkins. Let's take a look. Um, state representative, elected speaker of the House. Okay, so this is probably your incumbent here. <clears throat> Lots of community service. These are truly, <clears throat> pardon me, challenging times. The pandemic proves that we must invest our local health, safety, and economy. Together, we've invested in coronavirus responsible affordable housing, enacted the nation's first long-term care guarantee, public option health care, reduced tuition, increased job training, expanded mental health and addiction services, passed stronger gun laws, and secured protections for frontline workers, like all that. Continue to fight to ease the burden for struggling families. We will need a lot of that. Expanded health care, support for local business recovery, protect the vulnerable, take strong climate action. Okay, like it all. Sounds pretty good. Let's see what your opponent, Kyle, has to say. Uh, oh, wait, no, wrong one. That's, no, we don't want this guy. Uh, Ryan, that's who we're looking for, Ryan. There we go. Oh, like Ryan, young young man here, uh, prefers the Democratic Party. 
Uh, first run for office. Good for you, buddy. You're not going to win, but that's okay. Registered nurse. So that's a good line of work. Co-chair of 15 Now Tacoma's 2020 campaign to raise the minimum wage. I'm Ryan Tellen, running for state representative because our democracy is in crisis. Because of how our electoral system was designed, over 1 million voters left without representation. They personally voted for in Olympia. Uh, interesting. Further, our system frequently causes elections which only a single candidate runs despite our diverse beliefs that exist within the district. It's time for Washington to embrace proportional representation with ranked choice voting. Oh, yeah, I actually really like that a lot. Um, okay, so uh, this is one of my special SIG kind of votes. Um, Lorraine Jenkins is probably the right person for the job. She is going to win, I guarantee. Um, this guy is the first time running for this position. But uh, I want to support his efforts. So, um, and hold on, I got an alarm going up. So let me fix that. No. No, I think we got, no, we didn't get it. Oh, darling. One moment. Darling Anne, do you have an alarm going off of some kind? No, it's okay. Could you turn it off for me? Okay, I didn't know what device it was coming out of, so. We have a lot of electronic devices here. All right. Thank you very much, darling. Much appreciated. Okay. Back to the action. So um, this guy here, I am going to give him a vote. He is not going to win. Uh, I think Lori is the better choice, um, and I'm pretty sure she will win. So I'll just take that chance, and uh, we'll give Ryan some encouragement. So maybe he runs again, because uh, he seems like a pretty good guy. And I love... Um, uh, Proportional rank choice voting. I think it's a really good way to improve our voting systems around the country. So I'm definitely going to support that uh, because he's supporting it. Okay. So next up on the hit parade, state representative position number two. Uh, we have independent party and Democrat. Well, he's not running against a Republican. So I'll actually go and take a look at this guy. Uh, so Barry Knowles, let's give him a look and see what he's all about. Hey, Barry. Uh, so he was elected and served as the chairman for the 47th district GOP. Mm, okay. And he served as armed forces engineer during drug, but you know, he has distanced himself from the Republican party. So I'm going to give him the time of day here. Um, I, the fact that he was a Republican is perfectly fine. In fact, that kind of speaks well for him. Maybe seven years, armed forces specialist training. Okay. He's got a military background, fundraising for charities, the Masonic fraternity. That's nice. Uh, community involvement. Love to see that. Uh, statement. Uh, $30 car tabs, period. Oh, no. Uh, government's not responding to citizens' demands. In the case they're dictating over us. Dictatorship is directing us towards carbon taxes, variable street tolling, and state income tax, regardless if you want it or not. Do not trust career politicians with their fancy resumes full of wordy titles and positions held. Yeah, we like to call that experience, my friend. Um, if you want $30 tabs, and I don't care about $30 tabs, don't believe in sanctuary status. Actually, kind of do. Uh, yeah, okay, you're done. Yeah, sorry. Democratic Party. But hey, at least he's running on his principles. Good for him. All right, next up, Pierce County. Um, so we can collapse this giant legislative district area. All right, partisan office. We have a Republican and a Democrat. Sorry, Republicans. And, you know, honestly, like, I don't know, if, if conservatives ran on different kinds of platforms, I might go for them. But they tend to push my my liberal button issues. And they're like, I hate the environment. I hate, uh, like, helping people. I hate immigrants. And like, yeah, no, I actually like all people in the world. And I think they deserve a chance. So, no, thank you, sir. All right, no nonpartisan offices. Uh, assessor, treasurer. Um, well, you know, there's only one person running. I have been known to write myself in for office on, on occasion. Uh, you're welcome to write me in too if you like. I'd be delighted. But um, yeah, I'll just vote for this guy today. We're going to be simple about it. All right, Sheriff, I've got two candidates. So I think this is a county office here, Sheriff. We've got Ed Troyer. Uh, so Ed Troyer, what's your experience? Uh, this is the first office I've run for. It's the only office I'm going to run for. Okay. 35 years in the Sheriff's Department, 15 years as a detective, 10 as a patrol. Okay, so he's got a lot of experience here. He's qualified for this office, I think, to become sheriff. Uh, criminal justice degree, distinguished alumni, Washington State University. Very good. Uh, part of Crime Stoppers, State Gambling Commission, Toys for Tots, Taco Board member. Okay, sure, sure. 
Topco, sorry, Topco. Uh, statement. I'm the public information officer for the sheriff's department. Before that, I patrolled the streets. Many of you know me, earned my trust. I want to continue the relationship. I've been transparent and truthful as spokesperson, and I'll continue that openness as your sheriff. I'd rather hear like specifically things you've done or things you want to do. I'm, I'm glad you have a good reputation, but I can't verify that. I'm running to keep you and your family safe. Our sheriff department has a strong history of public trust, integrity, transparency. I've worked alongside Sheriff Pastor 15 years. I'm prepared to lead. Know our department from top to bottom. I was born in Tacoma, live in Pierce County my whole life. That's great. My wife and I adopted children, foster care, committed to the safety of all our families, hundreds of community leaders. Sounds good. I like him. Um, so this is Ed Troyer. Looking pretty good. Certainly worthy of a vote. Uh, based on experience, commitment to the community. I think those are important. All right. Sandy Fajardo. Fajardo, maybe. Maybe. All right, she's the president of the Pierce County Deputy Sheriff's Guild, a 32-year veteran, Pierce County Sheriff's Department, serving multiple leadership, supervisor of capabilities, commanding officer, Parkland Spanway. Okay, lots of experience here. Um, kind of a career person in this area. Uh, Pierce County Parks and Recreation, Athletic Youth. Pierce County Lieutenant uh, has precisely the type of law enforcement experience and new vision that we need to replace longtime Sheriff Pastor, who served as the Sheriff's Department with integrity and distinction. 32-year veteran of the Sheriff's Department, Lieutenant Fajardo brings an unqualified level of experience to this campaign, her leadership responsibilities, supervisory command, patrol, narcotics, search and rescue, community programs, uh, work to earn an excellent reputation. Choosing a sheriff can be a difficult challenge. Um, Cindy is certainly not a career politician, and she's definitely not a career spokesperson, so they're all like, we're not politicians running for sheriff. Please believe it. Um, but more importantly, uh, she's a career law enforcement officer. So is the other guy, too. Please cast your vote. Um, she has the direct hands-on experience and forward-thinking practical vision. <laughs> well, they both seem fine to me. Uh, you know, I kind of like uh, Ed's pitch just a little bit more, partly because it's personal. He's pitching himself. He's really kind of focused on his local commitment, why he cares about the community and stuff. So uh, I'm going to go with him based on the slightly better pitch that he's got going on here. Um, I mean, both seem pretty good. Um, so uh, difficult decision. I often vote for uh, women in these kinds of offices in this case, but uh, I'm going with kind of my feeling on this one and we'll vote for Ed. All right, next up, uh, partisan offices. We have an independent and we have a Democrat. Let's go ahead and start with our independent and see what kind of character he happens to be. Uh, so this is council district number four, county council district number four, Javier uh, Figura. Boy, pronouncing people's names can be tough. All right. Persia Independent Party, council member, male pro tem, mayor city, university place, President of Rainier Communication Commission, Arbiter. So he's got plenty of experience here. Like I said, I don't always boast on experience, but it's important to kind of know what people have got. So he's a pretty serious candidate. Undergraduate work, bachelor's administration, municipal leadership certification. I usually don't care a lot about that, but it tells you about a person's background, and sometimes I do care. Uh, community service, Audubon Society. That's nice. Grand Cinema. I like the Grand Cinema. State Council on Aging. All right. Pretty interesting guy. Um, so I've spent a lot of time at Ground Zero advocating for workable solutions in my community by digging from the bottom of difficult issues, identifying key players, market factors at work, sticking with the facts. Citizens should be able to have a sense of trust and pride in membership they elect. I intend on providing just that. Our communities are challenged with many issues that need to be prioritized. I will work with all interested parties resolving key community needs, such as putting people back to work in a new economy, restarting small businesses, expanding larger businesses in ways that are safe for the public, ensure uh uh financial responsibility and state uh sustainability in our communities in pierce county um community leader okay this is a quote from somebody else javier is truly a people's advocate always placing people before politics he's an experienced policy decision maker all right some other uh uh accolades from his other people doesn't really get into any kind of specifics about what his candidacy offers so well, that's interesting he seems competent i am not immediately turned off by him and I like people who have an independent mindset, generally speaking. Let's see what Ryan has to say. We supported plenty of Democrats today, so I have a mind to support the independent if I can. 
uh, Tacoma City Council, Metro Parks Commissioner, lots of political experience. Probably going to win this. Uh, served on the board of directors for Pierce Transit. Okay, he's definitely well entrenched in the government. Our region is confronting tough challenges, especially as we recover from the coronavirus. Stakes are too high. We need trusted, results-oriented leaderships to make real progress. Neighbors are worried about how to afford their daily lives. Okay, yep, 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 yep. That's why I'm running for city council. I continue finding a balanced solution uh, to our most pressing challenges, homelessness, affordability, community safety, mental health services, uh, good career jobs, tough problems that need experienced, thoughtful leadership. I know how important uh, collaboration is to make our community better. On the Tacoma City Council, I worked across different made uh, progressive change, supporting working families at higher minimum wage, paid sick leave, increased mental health services, made our neighborhood stronger with better streets, sidewalks, parks, and healthy environment. Uh, endorsed by the Pierce County Democrats. Uh, okay. Well, I like both of these guys, uh, certainly based on what they have to say. Now, we do have your occasional conservative in sheep's clothing running around, but again, I don't mind conservatives so much. Um, I think in this case, we're going to give the bone here to the independent party since uh, seems to be a good guy. I voted for plenty of Democrats. I'm sorry, Ryan. I'm sure you're lovely and I'm sure you'll probably win because you have the support of your party. But we're going to give a little bone to Yavi, Javier there um, to support what he's up to. So we like to do that sometimes here in my voting booth. Um, that's how that goes. All right, next up, the state Supreme Court. Mm, judicial issues are very important to me. And uh, so we need to close up county candidates here, I believe, and go to judicial candidates. All right, and so yeah, we're actually voting for our justices. I'm not sure that's the best idea, to be honest. Um, I don't know, like I view the judiciary as kind of a counterbalance in a way to uh, the public's uh, desire for different kinds of political views. So uh, I'm not 100% supportive of the idea that we should vote for justices, but uh, I'm not necessarily against it either. Anyway, let's get into these guys. Uh, Dave Larson, and I'm very glad that they're not uh, like, you know, partisan candidates. That would be bad. 23 years as a high rated attorney, 12 years as a judge, um, serving legislative, therapeutic courts. Uh, yeah, he's got a law degree and everything. 2018 hero of the Federal Way Schools Award. Oh, that's nice. Uh, Vincent DePaul Parish, member of the Key Kauaians. Uh, it's nice to be in part of these clubs. You know, I actually like those social clubs. I think they generally do good work. Uh, Judge Larson, our best choice for Senate Re Supreme Court Justice because he will protect the civic rights and uphold the law of constitution as written. Uh, Judge Larson has a record of fairness and impartiality, which is why he's enjoyed a strong support from Democrats, Republicans, and independents over his career. I like to see that. During his time of growing division, we need justice like Dave Larson. Dave Larson has been a champion for improving our courts as the presiding court of Federal Way. Uh, he has supported reforms to reduce domestic violence, combat drug addiction, and better serve the mentally ill. Great. Uh, Judge Larson knows these same approaches can be used to reduce the impacts of homeless crisis, uh, humanely making our community safer. I kind of don't like that there's sort of like a, you know, a political bent in here. Like, I do like those politics, but um, I don't think that belongs on a judge's thing. Like we should talk about his, uh, you know, I don't know, his record of completing cases or something. Uh, if you know Judge Larson, you know how much he cares about the people who appear in his courtroom. He's fair, compassionate, and respectful. <clears throat> These are all great things. He has a great legal mind. Okay, excellent. Uh, seems like a pretty good guy. He's sitting in there now, apparently doing, who knows, maybe a pretty good job. This is one where if you really want to research judges, you, you have to do a lot more legwork, I think. Um, that can be pretty difficult. Uh, if you're not legally minded. I, I also don't think most people, including myself, to be honest, are completely qualified to like judge judges. Anyway, next up, Supreme Court Justice, 20 years of judicial experience in Whatcom County Superior Court. Uh, so this is another experienced judge. Uh, lots of community service. Proud to serve as your highest court where I bring diverse judicial experience uh, from a reputation of fairness and common sense, making sure laws are applied without bias or political influence. I presided over therapeutic drug courts, provided innovative programs for children and families, managed hundreds of trials, including federal criminal trials, complex civil litigation. I'm committed to ensuring crimes are heard and supported. Washington's first Native American justice. I'm proud of my record and accomplishment and to appreciate the role of voice underrepresented communities. I've worked hard to earn the respect of my peers. I'm award-winning advocate for children and youth. I've worked to restore young lives rather than create a cycle of incarnation. 
uh, incarceration. That's very good. Um, yeah, uh, we must invest in early intervention, deter criminal behavior. Yeah, very good. Thoughts and approaches reflect in my exceptionally well-qualified evaluations. Okay, so both of these people are well-qualified for the job. Neither of them are yahoos. Both are very serious. Neither of them overly political, but both seem to have what I would call a liberal political vent. Um, and uh, so in the case of these tiebreakers, I do tend to vote for minorities uh, in these positions, or let's say the minority that you would find in this position as Supreme Court just, you're not going to find as many women. You're not going to find... Um, apparently any Native Americans. So uh, Raquel gets my vote in this case. Uh, good job. Uh, both worthy candidates. I think whoever you vote for here probably do a nice job. Only got one person running for position number four. We'll go ahead and support them. Position number six. Let's take a look. Uh, so we've got, which one is this? Position number six. There we go. Richard S. Cerns. Hmm. Okay. I will not comment on his appearance. I would love to comment on the appearance of some of these folks, their portrait pictures, but that really isn't important in politics, just for my personal amusement. Um, all right. Other professional experience. See professional experience below. Okay. So mediator, negotiator, hearing officer, investigative policy writer, human resources director for the Issaquah Federal Way School District, superintendent of schools. Okay, so he's been in the school area, education, University of Washington Law School, PhD. Okay, so he is a lawyer, uh, Walla Walla, or lawyer trained at any rate, superintendent endorsement. But he went into politics, and now he's interested in a judgeship. Well, that's fair enough. Statement, uh, Dr. Cerns is uh, election to the Supreme Court will provide invaluable insights into the important field of educational law. After teaching Washington State history and government, uh, Dr. Sams worked as a K-12 principal, completed his PhD researching education law in Washington State after completing his law degree from University of Washington, continued to work for Washington School Districts as Director of Employee Relations, et cetera. In these roles, Dr. Sam, uh issues involving education law, labor and employment law, individual rights, constitutional law, family law, Title X non-discrimination, harassment, bullying law. Okay, as a valuable part of the appellate court, varied uh, backgrounds, each justice brings a process and deliberation as school administrator, working with a wide array of complex issues involving uh, multiple stakeholders, wide respect to someone who listens carefully, respects and honors the rights and interests of all parties and acts with integrity and fairness. Yeah, well, these are good qualifications. Oh uh, yeah, seems pretty good here. Uh, G. Helen Winher is next on the hit parade. All right, got the minority tiebreaker going here. Uh, Justice G. Winher serves on the Washington State Supreme Court. Justice Winher is a former Pierce County Superior Court judge. Um, I mean, now, now I will say, like, you know, if we have balanced representation in the courts and in uh, life and government life and in uh, all aspects of life, then these tiebreakers wouldn't necessarily apply for me. But uh, I believe in, in nice proportional representation where we can get it provided everybody is well qualified. So qualifications first, that other stuff second. All right. A statement. I have over 21 years of legal experience and I'm asking for your vote and continued support. Legal expertise matters for this position. A little dig at her opponent there. Uh, and I am the most experienced candidate in the race. That is true. I have presided over thousands of cases to include complex criminal, civil, family law. Uh, I have a reputation for efficiency, fairness, uh, making well-reasoned decisions involving complex legal disputes across the board, range of subjects. I lecture for members of the legal and non-legal community locally, nationally, internationally, faculty member of Washington courts. Okay. Co-chair. All right. Just listing her experiences, married to an attorney and army retiree um, who resides in Pierce County. Okay. That part is a little strange to put on your resume there. Uh, but whatever, as the case may be, uh, I think she's going to get our vote here based on her continued existing experience. Um, Richard S. Cerns maybe could take a slightly lower judicial position to get started with, maybe? I don't know. But uh, we're going to go ahead with the incumbent. Position number seven, Deborah uh, is going to get my vote. Uh, so good for you. Over here, district position number one, Lisa uh, Wars War uh, Warswick. Warswick. There we go. We'll get my vote. Congratulations. And uh, last, the Superior Court District, uh, department number four. Uh, Pierce County Superior Court. Let's find that. Here we go. Got two candidates, Brady and Brian. So let's see who's who. All right, I got Brady. Nice looking fellow here. I am running because we need new leadership in the Pierce County Courthouse. 
if the last several months have shown anything, it's that the old ways of doing things are going not going to be enough. We need innovative, future-focused leaders to keep us safe and build a court system we can count on. I have the right mix of legal experience and solid understanding of how our court system works. This is important because all cases come before our courts. Really, all types of cases, you don't say. Uh, if you can count on me for a firm, fair, open-minded, someone who will do what the law requires, I do not think that law, what I think the law should say, being a judge is also about advocating for a justice system that works for everyone. I will dedicate as much time as possible. So I really don't know how you know what the law will say without saying what you think the law or should say. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess that's a fair point. Um, I think everybody kind of interprets the law, right? Let's, you can't really escape that. My wife, Kyla, my puppy, Luna, and I have made this community our home. Okay, that's nice. Uh, division of Child Support, Division of Social Health Services, Washington Administrative Staff in the Courts, Law Clerk, Washington Court of Appeals, oh, what's this, Educate BA, Political Science, Washington State University, um, College of Law, Lean Management, UW Tacoma. I don't know. He's not especially well qualified here for a superior court position. Uh, so let's take a look at Brian. Superior court judge to present. I mean, everybody's going to have a first time, right? But you got to kind of impress me if you want to get in the door on a judgeship. Uh, okay, so probably incumbent judge here. A fair judge. Well, I would hope so. <laughs> and here we go. An unfair, incredibly biased judge. Oh, well, I can't vote for him. All right. Now, um, Brian Kushoff believes courts exist to ensure public safety and settle disputes. Again, kind of stating the obvious. Judges should be impartial and reserve judgment until the facts are in. They must be applied the law equally. Brian is smart, practical judge, faithfully and fairly carries out the law, proven leader. Um, yeah, I don't think I need to get into too great a detail here. These are like quotes for him. The stakes, the court decisions are too important to be made by unprepared Brian's opponent has never tried a case in Pierre County Superior Court. His opponent's career is largely devoted to lobbying, not trial work. Yeah, you know, I kind of agree with you there, uh, Brian. So you get my vote. Uh, and uh, that's going to be that. Okay, we continue. All right, so now we get to review our stuff to see what we selected, making sure the very important one looks good. These other guys, uh, I think all good all around. I'm pretty careful, so we continue. Okay, now we need to fill out some email information and I'm going to privatize this portion of the broadcast. Actually, my email and phone number are incredibly easy to find, so it's not really that great a secret, but just in, I think for due diligence here, we're gonna black out that part of the screen. You're just gonna see me for a little bit. We'll pop back over here, so I'll fill out my email. I have some nice autofill here that's going to take care of that for me. Uh, okay, now the next part, um, I'll show you real quick on here, but then I'll hide it again because I'm going to do my signature. Bing! Is a signature. So you have to sign your electronic ballot and kind of an interesting little process in order to do that, but we're going to hide the screen once again. One of the great things is after you do these ballots, you can track them. So you can see what the status of your ballot is, whether your vote has been registered and tallied and all that kind of stuff. So that's one of the nice benefits of electronic voting. Uh, some of the downsides of electronic voting, the things that I do worry about a little bit are the idea that um, someone could get in and change the vote, stack the vote using electronic means, right? That is a little bit difficult. So I think for electronic voting, you need a really good secure system. I actually haven't looked a lot of research into exactly how Washington State is doing that, how they're registering the votes and stuff. But uh, I do have a general level of trust. And let's say any way that you vote can be manipulated. There is always schemes and there has been since the beginning of time, paper ballots, mail-in ballots, in managed voting, stamps on your skin. There are many, many ways that people try to prevent voter fraud. All of them can be defeated um, by people who have the will to do it. Some of them are a little easier to catch than others, let's say. Electronic means have some advantages in catching people who do voter fraud, as well as some advantages in trying to commit voter fraud. So I don't think it's inherently risky. I do think people should have a choice. So I think it's important that people can choose electronic ballots if they want to, if we have this system available. I also think it's important that people can choose to vote in person. And I think it's important that people can choose to vote by mail. I think voting by mail is probably the best right now. Um, it's really easy. It's really secure. You can do with this process that I'm doing. You can sit at home, think about your thing, talk to loved ones, do whatever you want, make your vote. Now, um, some people want the privacy of the voting booth so nobody, not even their family, can see what they're doing. That's great. We need that available to people. 
right? So it's important that that be possible. But um, my wife is not going to beat me up for who I vote for. Um, and uh, I don't have to worry about that. Don't have to worry about my friends bullying me or anything else. So I'm feel free to share my vote and not worry about it too much. Um, and I'm not too worried that anyone's going to tamper with my vote or change it or anything like that. So uh, I'm going to focus for a moment on this signing process to make sure I do it correctly. I'm going to click to sign. And then unfortunately, I have to use my, oh, I have a touch screen actually. So I'm going to move my microphone uh, out of my way a little bit and use the touch screen because I think I will get a better version of my signature this way. And I think I got a pretty good facsimile of what my regular voting thing looks like. I'll dot my I. It's not exactly the same, but it'll do, I think. Um, it's one of the tricky things here. Okay, so I'm going to get my screen switched back on now that I've finished with my signature. That's something I don't want to share on the internet, particularly. Although, once again, I, I bet somebody who is really enterprising could probably find it on something somewhere that's been loaded to the internet. Okay, so uh, election return. Uh, you're about to return your ballot uh, submission electronically. Please complete the following steps to complete your ballot package submission. Step one, verify. So view the package. Uh, da, 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 da. So there's a declaration signature. Sheet. Oh, oh, there's my signature. Oh, well, we kind of screwed that up a little bit and my date of birth. So we'll... Uh, Close the preview there. Oh, well, we can blur that out if I post a video up later. So we verified the package. Next two, verify your ballot. View my ballot. Uh, is this going to have that on there? This is what a Washington state ballot will look like, a printed one. I don't know if they print them out. It may be that this electronic one um, prints out <coughs> a ballot and then it's tracked by paper that way, which I think is a great idea. Really good. You get verification. You get the convenience of electronic voting with the verifications of a paper trail. I get to see my ballot, so that's great. I'm going to close that preview. That looks good to me. Finally, submit. Boom. We can view it again if we want, but we're pretty happy with that. Success. Your ballot package has been submitted successfully. Thank you for voting. Well, there you go. And thank you for watching today. So let's see. Uh, have I got any final thoughts maybe on electronic voting today? Hmm. I don't know. I think it's a good thing. Um, I'm really happy to share this. A lot of people don't know that you can do this. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, voting by computer is going to be super scary. The hackers are going to steal it. Well, I'm on a VPN connection. I've got encrypted broadcast going on here. Um, I am publicly broadcasting what I'm voting. So if you're worried about privacy, don't do this. Uh -huh. uh, there are risks. I do not advocate people generally live stream their voting. I just thought it would be a novel and interesting thing to do and a way to kind of educate people a little bit about this process. So online voting, I think it's pretty secure. It looks like they're gonna print a paper ballot and put that into the cycle. So I'll be able to be tracked just like every other Washington mail-in ballot. Uh, there's a lot of talk, nonsense from our President Trump about uh, dangers of mail-in voting and how it's really spooky and, and the, oh, so much fraud, so much fraud. Well, Washington state has had mail-in voting for maybe 20 years, at least like a dozen years now. And for everybody in the state, if they want it, you can also go vote in person if you want to. So that option is available to you, which I think is important. Um, and we don't have massive voter fraud. We haven't had a lot of problems with that. In fact, most of the absentee ballot fraud that you see is down in the deep south and some small rural counties where, you know, uh, if you rig a few votes, maybe that'll make a difference. Um, and uh, in Florida, because Florida... Uh, <laughs> And so like, if you go look at the list, uh, there's a nice website, a conservative website, I think that, that has a list of all the uh, voting fraud cases that have been brought and their outcomes and where they are. And you can go look at that list and you will see that the states that do all veil in voting do not have higher levels of fraud. And yet it is convenient. It's very easy for people to vote. And the thing that I love about this online voting and about the other voting is we can be very deliberative. You can take your time. Normally, actually, with the ballot, uh, I may take a few days to kind of do this process, go over, read everybody's candidate thing. I'll spend a few hours doing it longer than this broadcast. But like I said, I did some pre-research on the ballot issues because those are the things I kind of deliberate on the most. Uh, you know, when you're voting for people, it's really a little bit about trust and what they say they are and how they represent themselves. Um, but when you're voting for specific initiatives, I think you have to do the homework and actually look it up and try to understand it. That or find somebody who did do the homework and follow their advice, I think is the best way to go. At any rate, uh, you can do that with a mail-in ballot. When you're sitting there in the voting booth, you're going to have to do all that beforehand and you're going to have to remember everything. 
eh, eh, I like this better. I think this is better. Uh, it's just a more deliberative process. Now, there are problems with mail-in voting. Some people in their families, you know, are going to be pressured by other members of their family. And I think everybody individually has the right to vote. So if going to the polling place to make your vote is what works for you, I think you should do it. Um, and I think that's your right. So I think that's pretty important. And I like that uh, mail-in voting has a paper trail. It's got this piece of paper. It's your ballot. And you can verify that. Right? It doesn't have your name attached to the ballot. The way they do it is you personalize the envelope that the ballot comes in. Well, actually, there's two envelopes. There's an outside envelope that's kind of personalized for you so that we can count. Yeah, this guy is registered to vote. Yes, he has only voted one time. Then they open it up and they take out the sealed ballot. And now it's kind of anonymous. Uh, it does kind of have a tracking number, right? But the two things are not directly connected. It goes into the system and the votes get counted. So that you can't really link the counted votes to your identity, uh, at least not very directly. Um, and, you know, so it maintains some sense of an anonymity, but you can track that it was counted and, and see verification of it. You can go onto the Washington website and see that, yes, my mail-in ballot was received and yes, it was counted. And then you know that your vote was counted uh, and that's kind of great. And they have a tracking mechanism. They know who voted and who didn't vote. And if they're on the registration rolls or if they're not on the registration rolls, that's something people don't understand a little bit about this whole voter ID kind of stuff. Yeah, it's important that we make sure people who are eligible to vote, vote, and people who aren't eligible to vote, don't vote. But that's done usually through voter registration because you got a lot of time. You can get your ID together. You can go down, do your registration. It's not like this one day deadline. And if there's a problem, you can't vote. If there's a problem, you work at it until you get it done, you get registered, then you are good to go. That's the idea. And then so when the actual voting happens, it's all pretty clean, quick process. You've been vetted ahead of time. That's the idea of voter registration. It makes a lot of sense. Um, this voter ID stuff, we don't want people to vote without identification. Kind of bullshit, to be honest, okay? Because voter registration is supposed to take care of that. Do problems happen? Yeah, sometimes the problems happen. Do dead, dead people stay on the registration rolls? Yeah, sometimes they do. That's really the job of the county government. If we Americans weren't so squeamish about registering ourselves, you know, with the government in some way, then the government would be better able to know when we die because you would report this person is deceased and then the government could automatically take you off the voter registration rolls and all that kind of stuff. But we Americans are very squeamish about this kind of idea that anyone could track us. And so we don't do that. And it makes it the job of the voter, uh, you know, identification really quite difficult. So we make it hard for ourselves uh, a lot of the time to do these sorts of things because we're a bit afraid. Sometimes fear is good. Sometimes I think it gets in the way of, of doing smart things, but uh, we're all entitled to our own political opinions. I think that's really important. So I have strong political views, but I'm not going to call you a monster because you vote for Donald Trump or you do anything else. Um, I'll leave that to other people. <laughs> no, you, you get to pick. Uh, that's America. That's democracy. That's kind of the heart of this idea that we, the people, make the government. And the government runs at our behest is we have that ability to express our political view without a uh, threat of violence or... Um, uh, that kind of thing. Now, you know, are you going to be socially ostracized if you do something that other people don't like? Maybe you will. That's part of the risk of the body politic and having an opinion uh, in life. Some people don't like your opinions uh, and they don't have to like your opinions either, right? That's not a requirement either. Um, we just have to sort of give each other a certain level of respect, right? That we all need to live together in society. Um, and yet we need to be able to have diverse political opinions so that we can have change, so that we can make improvements over time. I think that's pretty important. So please keep that in mind uh, when you're thinking about voting. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, we're going to sign out. If you have any questions, uh, if you'd like a video topic that you'd like me to address uh, about voting or about politics or anything else, um, or you have a comment on the way I voted, or you'd like to tell people how you vote, well, cool. Uh, you're welcome to do so.